All right. Welcome, everybody, to Artful Tuesdays. I am joined by Anne, Jeff, and Audra. So Jeff and Audra are with the Ayn Rand Institute Archives, the Ayn Rand Archives. And today we're going to be talking about the letters of Ayn Rand and the archives. Wanted to dig into this. Um, I thought before, real quick, if you guys are okay, I'd like to start us off with one little quote from one of her uh, letters, and then I uh, could leap us, leapfrog us into this conversation. So this is a letter dated uh, August 18th, 1945, again, in the Letters of Ayn Rand, which is available online um, as an audio book or as, as a, um, an ebook, or you can buy it as a print book. And it's to Private First Class Gerald James, a fan. Now, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but they... It was a very positive letter. He he apparently gave her a lot of praise and he loved her book. And so, and he asked her some questions and there's some interesting responses she has to these questions. And one of the questions, I guess, um, based on her response was, uh, here's the quote from the letter that she wrote to private first class, Gerald, have I, Ayn Rand, have I embodied some of my own qualities in Dominique? And she says, yes, I'm continuing the quote. Am I Dominique? No. And then she says, as the enclosed picture of me will demonstrate, sorry to disappoint you there, but I never thought I'd live to be a pinup girl, so I couldn't pass up such a chance. If that space on your wall is still blank. So apparently there was space on his wall. He said, I wanted a picture or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I thought this is a good segue into like the letters of Ayn Rand itself, but also, you know, what the archives does, like, do you guys track down these types of pictures? Like, do you have his Gerald's letter? Like, what what's going on in the archives? So, Audra, Jeff, if we could bring you on to the conversation, whichever one. Yeah, is sure. Uh, I guess um, I'll say just a brief word about the archives. The Ayn Rand Archives is the is a repository of information by and about Ayn Rand and those influenced by her, including other people and organizations. And it's the largest theme collection of Ayn Rand related materials in the world. And it houses, among other things, her personal papers, which is the material that she collected and retained during her life as a um, developing intellectual and as a writer and was found in her apartment at the time of her death. And in addition to that material, we also collect evidence of Ayn Rand's impact in the culture. And that uh, has both a, a component which is physical and also digital because Ayn Rand's uh, influence now bridges two centuries uh, and two different ways of communicating her ideas and her art to the world. And Audra is uh, my associate at the archives. And uh, I basically handle anything you can pick up and squeeze and break, hopefully not break. And Audra, break handled, Audra <laughs> handles everything that you can um, convert into zeros and ones and Audra, take it away. Yeah. Yep. So I'm, I'm the digital archivist and um because this is an online exhibit in in this version, although as Kirk mentioned, of course, there's still the the print book. Um, this fell under my purview to to kind of get the previous archivist had started this project, and I I picked up um, kind of in the middle, but had lots of help from volunteers and fellow staff members at ARI, obviously, um, to get this out. But um, so you asked about other material that we have. And um, the answer is yes, we, I believe we do have um, private first class Gerald James's letter to Ayn Rand. Um, we okay, have we many. Have that. Yes. Um, now, people who've read the book or who have looked at this exhibit will note that it's almost exclusively letters from Ayn Rand to other people. And that's for intellectual property reasons. Um, the, the copyright you know, you, you have copyright in anything that you create, which includes letters that you send to people. And so um, the copyright of Ayn Rand's work fell to her intellectual heir, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, when she passed away. And so we've been able over the years to, you know, speak with Dr. Peikoff about her papers and, you know, things, things that the intellectual property belonged to her and now to him. 
and get permission to share it. Um, and so that's what happened with both the print version of the letters of Ayn Rand and also with, with this, this digital version online, um, is we have permission to share the things that she wrote. Now, the letters that were written to her, the copyright for those belongs with the person who wrote that letter or with their heirs. And as you can imagine, that's a large number of people <laughs> uh, to try and and you have to find them. You have to be able to have a conversation with them about getting permission to share those sorts of things. And so that's a complicated process. And so that's why there really aren't, you know, I think there's maybe one exception in, in this whole this whole set of material, there's maybe one letter to her from somebody else, but for the vast, vast majority of it, that's why we can't include those letters. Although we own the physical copies of them in, in the archives. Oh. Um, and we can, we can look at so, them and, you know, researchers can come look at the physical copies and, and that sort of thing, but sharing them online counts as publishing. And because we don't own the copyright in them, we're not allowed to do that. Yes. So. so like, like a researcher who wants to dig deep into Ayn Rand's life as well, like to get a sense of these back and forth letters, they can go to you physically in California, correct? To see these, or are they also digitized? They, they can contact us to ask about access. Yep. So that's, and there might be various ways that we could accommodate access. It would depend on the particular request and the particular circumstances that, that a researcher had. But yeah, they're, yeah. they're welcome to get in touch with us. Um, but that's one of the values of the archives, right? Is that you guys yes. have this so we can, yep. you know, mm -hmm. you're preserving all this, even though you can't necessarily publish every right. single one. There right. are exceptions, like in you you were able to publish Frank Lloyd Wright's letters, because they were so wonderful, you got permission, correct? Yes. And, yeah. you know, I'll say, and this is this is down the line, but there, there are some correspondents whom you see her, you know, you see her side of the correspondence with some of these people, you know, more well-known figures where I think down the down the road a bit, we have no specific timeline on this, but we would like to go to I think it's often the estate of, of these people now. Many of them aren't aren't around anymore. Um, but when you have, say, a chunk of letters from one person who's fairly well known, whose papers have gone maybe to an institution somewhere, and there's an estate to talk to, it's like that's a circumstance where we can we can do more of that asking for permission. And so we we will hopefully down the road try and get those permissions for at least some of the other side of the correspondence and maybe eventually be able to make both sides of it available. But um, when you you get into the, the issue of say fan letters where it's just a random individual from somewhere who liked the Fountainhead or who really liked Atlas Shrugged or liked We the Living and wrote to her, it gets very hard to to even identify those people or who their heirs might be much yeah. less find contact well, we're, information. We're so lucky to have Ayn Rand keeps so, up, you know, she kept her, yes. you know, when she was yeah. young, her favorite music, her yeah. favorite movies. I mean, we're just so lucky that she was that kind of person and that you have, I don't know, more than 600 letters online for free that people go and look at and it's, they could do I it. I think it's 591, but yeah, almost 600. Yep. Mm -hmm. By the great. way, you guys have some super chat fans right now. Oh, great. Um, really? Mary Aline just sent a couple oh. bucks. Thank you, Mary Aline. Bonnie has best. a question. Bonnie Bertrand has a question with the super chat. Um, and maybe you you both, Jeff and Audra, can answer this. Will the second edition of letters ever be in print? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, I forgot to get an update, I'm afraid, on the exact status of this. I don't think there's going to be a second print edition. Um, but there is going to be an ebook of the second edition through oh. through the original publisher. Um, so I'm not. I, and I apologize again. I, I forgot to no, get an exact great, so status update that. on this, but that is in progress. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know when exactly it will be out, but that is definitely something that is happening. So you won't be able to go. I mean, if if you're familiar with it, I mean the the first print edition is already a pretty thick book, and then we. Uh, I, I, you know, I believe you talked with Mike Berliner before the, the editor is like he added a lot of material in for this version. So I think it would get a little bit unwieldy, maybe as a print <laughs> edition, but as yeah. an ebook, the length Too doesn't long. matter quite so much. So there yeah. they are. The publisher is doing an ebook edition. So you'll be able to buy that, have it on your tablet, your Kindle, whatever. Oh, that's great. That's like. great. Hey, uh, Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, 
do you have a letter that perhaps you would like to share with us? Yeah, if I can set it up. Um, now, I've been with the Ayn Rand papers for a long time, I guess. It's probably been, I've been working on Ayn Rand related projects since the early 90s. Um, and in so doing, I was able to take a look at some of the letters that we have on online in very early stages of their physical arrangement, which meant I was really looking at things in boxes that hadn't been um, previously seen since Ayn Rand's secretaries filed these things. Wow. And, and that was like the 40s and 50s and that kind of mid 20th century? Yeah, mid 20th century stuff. And uh, that was an area that was a big gap in my knowledge about Ayn Rand because there's not a lot of biographical information about her at the time. I was working on a a documentary about Ayn Rand that uh, was uh, released eventually called Ayn Rand, A Sense of Life. Um, and the in, in working on that show, I remember confronting boxes and boxes of, of uh, document cartons or banker's boxes, as they're called, with folders with handwritten in, um, information sometimes in Ayn Rand's hand, sometimes in the hand of her secretaries, but always containing something of interest. And one of the things that I found at the time was uh, a letter I looked at as potential material to include in another file. It's always, you go from one large file to a smaller file, a, a production file of things I assembled to include in the script for the documentary Ayn Rand and Sense of Life. And I was working on that with the, the writer director, Michael Paxson. So I was sort of like the research microbe moving out among the papers in the boxes, wherever they were and filing, you know, moving through these things rapidly to pick out gems that I thought might be of potential value. And there was one letter, which uh, fortunately um, was of interest. And it, it was a letter from Colin uh, to the actor Colin Clive. Uh, Colin Clive was a uh, an actor in Hollywood that Ayn Rand was familiar with, who had appeared among other uh, roles in the the role of uh, Doctor Frankenstein in the Universal adaptation of of Frankenstein, and he appeared. Uh, Colin Clive appeared in a play that Ayn Rand attended in Hollywood in the early '30s, and this is a section of her. A uh, letter to him, a fan letter that she wrote um, in praise of his performance. And, and this particular paragraph eventually made it into the script of the documentary, Ayn Rand, A Sense of Life. Um, I, I'm not going to do justice to it, because if you really want to hear it read well, you ought to listen to the, watch the film and hear uh, the um chocolatey, bourbony voice of Sharon Glass give these uh, lines. But this is nice. the, uh, the passage from the Colin Clive letter, Ayn Rand to Colin Clive. <clears throat> Quote, the word heroic does not quite express what I mean. You see, I am an atheist and I have only one religion, the sublime in human nature. There is nothing to approach the sanctity of the highest type of man possible and there's nothing that gives me the same reverent feeling, the same feeling when one spirit wants to kneel bareheaded. Do not call it hero worship, because there is more to it than that. It is a kind of strange and improbable white heat where admiration becomes religion, and religion becomes philosophy, and philosophy the whole of one's life. End quote. Now, one of the things that I think is really important for people who approach these letters, this large trove of letters online, is to if, step back and think of what's really important to them. Because I don't think you can really mine any of this information unless you walk into it with uh, a clear idea of what is really important to you. And it was important to me not just to pick a good letter for inclusion in a in a movie, but it was important to me in, in in a longer picture because my whole engagement with the 
the archives enterprise really developed as a college student when I was a studying philosophy at a university and was in the university library or in this case the philosophy library thinking of ways to get access to information about Ayn Rand and mm. I saw scant information about her scant mentions in journals in uh essay form or in book form or and certainly on the libraries at the university. And I thought one day, wouldn't it be great if we could have all of this material assembled in an easy and an accessible way for people who wanted to chart their own course among it, to pick out things that were important to them and uh, explore it. So the idea of the archives, just as a big picture thing is important to me, but this particular letter happened to be really um, telling and important to me because it, it 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 furnished an important moment in a in a film, which I think um, opened a lot of doors to understanding what Ayn Rand is about. So that's why I think the Audra's online exhibit will in turn open a lot of potential doors for people who are encountering these letters for the first time. Yay! Now, Wonderful. Um, can I first off, we do have a couple more super chats. I wanted to ask uh, this real quick, and I have yeah. some questions too. That that was wonderful. You had. You made somebody cry, by the way, with that reading. So it was very <laughs> bourbon-y cool. and, um, you know, a bit chocolatey <laughs> as well, I think. So good work. Um, but you. Mary Lynn had a, a, a super chat question, which I'd like mm -hmm. to address to you. Um, at some point, will the copyrights expire on the letters from others to Ayn Rand? So the yes. answer to that is yes. Um, the specifics of figuring out when can be a little complicated. Copyright law in general is a little bit complicated. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert by any means. Um, letters, personal letters of this nature generally fall into the category of unpublished material, which has different timelines associated with it in terms of copyright than, than published material. So a book, say, at least I believe in current copyright law is generally life of the author plus 70 years, and then it will fall out of copyright. Mm -hmm. um, unpublished material is longer than that, I believe. Um, but so the answer is yes, someday it will, but it's for most of this material, which as we noted earlier, is a lot of it is mid 20th century. Um, some yeah. of it's a bit earlier than that, but. Uh, like this one was 1945 when she got it, right? When she received, or when she sent hers out. So I assume it was 1945 when she received it. If you're talking about the one you read. Sorry, the, yeah, the one, the Geralt, the private yes. first class one. Yep. So, yeah. so, you know, whatever the date on his letter is, it's some amount of years, you know, after that. And I don't remember the specifics and it can vary depending on what kind of unpublished material it is. There's further complications um, there, but so yes. And we will track those things, but just know that it's, it's quite a ways down the line still before yeah. any of that would be, would be falling out of copyright and there, therefore genuinely be, be open. Well, I mean, I, I, I I'm more interested in what Ayn Rand wrote than what he wrote, but um, is there a way electronically for you all to know how many times people are looking at the letters or is that something that is? Um... Um, I think that there is, that's another thing that I'm afraid I forgot to check in on. So that's okay. our, our IT team tracks that sort of information. Cool. So I, I don't have direct access to it, but yes, I, sure, I think. But it's trackable. There is data. It, it is trackable, yeah. just broadly speaking, on the, the back end of our website. So that's great. That's great. No. Hey, go ahead, Kirk. But I do have a little bit of a letter I want to read, and we're getting through our halfway point, in case you're interested. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, you go ahead and read yours. I have a, a general question I wanted to ask. Um, I can ask after you. Great. This is just a, a little paragraph. Let's, yeah, let's hear your letter. Letter 136. Yeah. You asked me why The Fountainhead is a bestseller. Do you want my sincere answer? because there are more people of intelligence and good taste in the United States than I expected to find. I don't think of it as I have lived up to the public. I think the public has lived up to me. There is a story told about Michelangelo, which illustrates this beautifully. One of his statues, that of David, I believe, 
he made a muscle which never existed on a real human body. When he was told that nature never created such a muscle, he answered that nature should have. Mm -hmm. That is the true artist. Thank you. <laughs> I love great. when she talks about art and artistry for sure. That's a great. I have to say that one thing that's so great about these letters is that they're they're very self-contained sometimes. I mean, so you can actually mine them for a lot of information and insights about issues that don't require necessarily the ping-ponging from one letter oh, to another. Oh, right. You could search. Right. Now, that's not to say that the engaging of a, a of correspondence isn't revelatory of the a person that you're primarily interested in. Sometimes letters to Ayn Rand contain summaries of points discussed over the phone, not otherwise in print, that Ayn Rand is responding to. So the, the letters to her are sometimes uh, filled with interesting insights into oh, I see. Yeah. the person that you're primarily interested in. And that's why it's really great to have access to both. But certainly you can... Uh, relish access to the uh, side that we have made available because they're so filled with information and insight. Thank you. What yeah. did you want to bring up, Kirk? Yeah, I, I mean, we're all very creative people here, I think. And we've all, you know, like Jeff, you created a, a, a movie. I Help. I think, what's that? Help to create. Sure. Um, and you know, I, uh, I, you know, I, I think I have used certain what I hope is fair use copy of certain aspects of Ayn Rand, and there's a lot of amazing material here for people who want to do like podcasts and YouTube shows where they, you, you know, just as an example, I won't go into the whole thing, but there's like amazing letters of her in snippets throughout the whole place where she's really thinking about her career in one various aspect right like she and she gives specific goals of like i want to accomplish this in movies or i'm out right like she talks like that and she explains what she's talking about and it's you know so like for people who are trying to be creative and create like a blog post or you know podcasts and repurpose some of this i wonder if you could give them some guidance on how they could do this you know without getting in trouble and, and maybe you know getting some use out of out of like not only what's there but um you know what's what's also on the online version right because this is still all copyright written at the moment for a while i would imagine right so like another 70 years now that it's in print is that how it works with this one well there's a there's fair use uh you know you yeah. can incorporate a certain amount of this but i think the most important guideline is just make sure that you own the idea yourself i mean that you can express it in your own language and it's meaningful to you mm. and if it's if it's an excerpt of her that supports a point that you're making, then you're primarily expressing it in your own terms. And you can, uh, whether you're uh, offering a, you know, just an account, a summary of what she said, or you're offering a, a point that relates to a point that she's making, I think um, keeping that perspective will keep you from overindulging in excessive quotation. <laughs> That's a really, that's very helpful. Actually, I like that. I just made it up. So let me know. If <laughs> it's not, you're, you're saying we can't uh, quote that in, in a law when you take us to court. So, well, Jeff said, you, as long as you're to the spirit. And, and if okay. I said it, you can blame me if it doesn't work. So it's, it's, work, it's working I, for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you, you know, some of the most important stuff about archives that I never really understood until I worked at ARI and talked to Jeff and Audra about this stuff is the, just the, the creative uh, creations possible. Like there's just an endless amount of creations, possible configurations of them. Right. What do you think of that? I feel if like I have something to say. I have Jeff. a lot to say about yeah, that. No, Jeff, Audra, uh, Jeff do I don't know any? if you were going to, disagree with me or like go off on a, an amazing inspirational oh no, no i think there's energy. absolutely oh my gosh there's so much you can do with this material i mean you can um you know i think it's as a critic or a advocate a partisan or a nonpartisan. there's rich 
opportunity across the board. Now, I'll speak from the perspective of of someone who wants to, uh, you know, who who's with this stuff and, and wants to, you know, take advantage of the um, positive aspects of it. There's simply the opportunity to steep in the material and just park yourself in the conversational flow of which you're experiencing only one part. That is a remarkably refreshing and invigorating experience. And if you've read the letters of other authors that you're eager for and want to learn more about, you know that there's details about the life, details about what they're pursuing, things that ultimately can redound back to you and inform your life and what you're doing. So that's just a very personal perspective. And that doesn't require anything than just uh, opening your laptop and, and plugging into the material. If you're interested in a historical topic, there's, and I know Audra can elaborate this point, there's tons of material that can stimulate a revisit of American history. Uh, that can enable you to drill more deeply into a topic that you just barely saw a glimpse of or passed by an issue of in your your school or in your daily interaction with the, the news and and other kinds of uh, literary sources. But there's that that's a a door opening experience. And then from the perspective of the creative artist, I mean, if you're not looking, um, oh, I, I jumped over being you know an academic or a journalist and going in and mining this material for some other purpose. But as a as I'll say one last thing, and I'm sure Audra will want to talk about the the historical uh, values of this. Um, I mean, think of how many people have been inspired by Shakespeare artistically, literarily, poetically, uh, in terms of film, in terms of acting, other parts, in terms of painting. And then think of the wealth of opportunity that Ayn Rand offers for similar kinds of engagement and, and expression and, and push out points. That's a, an incredible legacy uh, that I, I rather, I think that the letters are, an are a part of an incredible legacy that we're, the archives is making available. And I'm looking forward to seeing the, the fruit of that moving forward and what people do with it or creatively. Yeah. Yeah. The history. And again, for me, this is, this is a personal interest. I come from a history background. I've always been interested in history since, since I was, um, since I was small, but that was one of the big things that struck me, both just reading this, the set of letters that's available here, but also more broadly, just looking at her personal papers is how much history of the United States in the 20th century there is in it. And it's, it, it was, and it, it concretized and personalized that history. So, you know, as Jeff said, it's like, you know, you read something in a textbook, for example, because this one particularly stuck out to me about, um, you know, the, the bad conditions in Europe in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And you go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Lots of infrastructure destroyed, you know, a lot of people dead. But then you read her letters to Marie struck off and her letters to her cousin um and who who are both living in Europe in the immediate aftermath of World War II and it's just it's a different perspective on that of she's sending them care packages so that they have enough food to eat so that they have cloth to make clothes out of and that's a very different, you know, way to sort of experience that moment in history is from the very personal perspective of someone living in the United States who, fortunately, at that point, she was she was doing pretty well herself in her life, but she had people she cared about who were stuck in Europe. And I mean, her cousin lived there and, and continued to live there and was okay, but 
you know, this woman who was a former teacher of hers and, and whom she felt very close to um, was stuck in a displaced persons camp and was in some danger of potentially being deported back to Russia where she might have been killed. And Ayn Rand didn't want that to happen to someone that she cared about. And so she fought hard to make sure that she could bring Marie to the United States. And she did eventually succeed in helping her get a visa and, and getting her here. But it's like, that's a very different perspective than a textbook on that that part of, of American history. And there's other material in her papers that, that touches further on that. But even just reading her letters that are here, that she's sending to, you know, to these people, these friends and family that she cares about, it's like that was that was really striking to me, I guess, as as um, something here. And and beyond that, just, you know, the correspondence that she has with people like Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, Leonard Reed, Channing Pollock, these people who are involved in the that mid 20th century sort of pro individual freedom, pro liberty movement. It's like there is interesting history there. And this is partly why I would like us to eventually, if we can, get permission to share the other half of that correspondence, because mm -hmm. it is historically, I think it's very interesting. And I don't think a lot of people are, are looking at that kind of his, intellectual history right now. Not that nobody has done so, but just there's there's a, a bias in academic history that doesn't look at that side of the conversation that was happening of people who are very against the New Deal right from the get-go and, you know, some people who had experience with the Soviet Union, and that's not just Ayn Rand, you know, Rose Wilder Lane traveled to the Soviet Union, and that was actually a big part of what turned her away from being interested in, in socialism and communism was because she went over there and was honest about what she saw, both with herself and with others. And so there's a lot of history just in these letters. Um, and to me, who's very interested in history, that's that's really fascinating, and I really enjoy that that part of them. So, so there seems to be a broader, like a, a point of just making history real to you in general. Mm -hmm. That's valuable in any kind of first source material, which this is, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And then I would even add to that because we probably a lot of people listening to this have studied objectivism, the philosophy a little bit. And Ayn Rand really stresses, you know, the importance of that, not only with history, but also philosophy and these abstract ideas that she's expounding on in the books that she's published. And one of the deep values that I got in reading through the letters was seeing Ayn Rand put her own philosophy in practice, mm -hmm. the way she judged, the way she thought about things over time. And you could see even... She's not arriving at it, you know, uh, uh, out of the blue, you know, w w like magic, like she's discovering things along the way. And you could, that's one of the great values I really got is seeing her as a, basically a girl, a young girl making mistakes almost and, you know, getting in with the wrong people a little bit and being disappointed with them uh, over and over again. And it's, and then coming up with principles that you aren't always necessarily in the letters themselves. Sometimes they are, but I think then you could see the parallel if you've read her other work and on philosophy. You know, I, and her, I, obviously I do sure. love getting yeah. into her personality, you know, yeah. getting her enthusiasm, getting her sensitivity, her caring, her loving. I mean, it's a very personal view, you know, but we don't have a biography and, it's as close to biography as we get, but I was very taken by the the the, the view of Ayn Rand in the letters from oh, yeah. what she actually said, what she actually did as as a just... Like she wanted to be a pinup girl. Is like <laughs> you're not gonna get that in capitalism, the unknown ideal. <laughs> yeah, that that, that well, she wanted to be a pinup girl, but it was very courageous. Like, I'm not a pin. Here's what I am. You know, it's it's not. You know, I can't send you a picture of me. That's not her. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I should correct myself. I, she didn't want to be a pinup girl. She said she never thought she would live to be a pinup girl, but now she yeah. is one, right? Yes. There you go. Yeah. Thank you for correcting. Sure, sure. Um, okay. So did you, Anne, have any other questions about the archives specifically? We do have a super chat question though. Um, while we're, we're waiting for this, 
um, which is from Bonnie Bertrand. By the way, you guys are generating a lot of super chats. So keep oh, it up, everybody. Yeah, the people <laughs> are, people Good. in the audience are loving you too. Um, will more letters be published someday? That's by Bonnie Bertrand. More letters um, be published. So uh, I may have sort of answered this already. Uh, not, yeah. I think, as part of this exhibit, particularly, or or of this book. You know, I think this is this is probably its its final form, shall we say? Um, but in the context of say further online exhibits down the road, um, or other, you know, someone else might do a different book at some point. Um, yes, I think the answer ultimately is yes, but I don't have any answers about exactly what or exactly when <laughs> that might be. So yes, but but yeah, keep keep an eye on us. Um, I'll. Can't say too much, but I'll tease that there will be a new online exhibit coming soon. <laughs> so oh, keep an eye on on ARI related things. You'll you'll see more about that when um, when it's out. And uh, can we say that's one of the perks of being an ARI donor because they did actually <laughs> yes, get a yep, heads up donors, on that donors donors do special... you get some some previews and some heads yeah. up on on those sorts of things. So so become an Ayn Rand Institute donor. Um, there was, so there was a few things. I don't know if, Anne, you had one, but Audra, I don't know if you actually, did you read what, or choose one of your favorite letters? I didn't I would love read to hear, anything yet. Yeah. If you'd like would, me to. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear one of your favorite letters. Interestingly, um, it's, it's from the same letter. I think that Anne read from earlier, although it's a different part. So this is letter 136. Um, did you coordinate? This is part of a series of letters that she was writing to a man named Gerald Loeb, whom she had a, a friendship mm. with at at one point, and wow. um, he, one of the primary things they were discussing was fiction writing because he was trying to get into fiction writing. And of course, this is this is 1944, so the Fountainhead's been out for a little over a year at this point. So she's had some success as a fiction writer at this point. Um, and uh, so, and all of these letters, I think, are really interesting. Her advice to him is very interesting in a general sort of way. But there, there was one, um, one section that kind of jumped out at me as I was reading these for the first time. He had asked about how to write a bestseller, which, of course, Ayn Rand had just done um, in mm -hmm. in the Fountainhead. And what she tells him is, of anything I may tell you, which you might find of value, this is the most important. Do not set out to write with your eyes on the box office. It can't be done. <laughs> you must write that which you consider good to the best of your judgment, taste, and ability. There is no other rule or standard to go by. If you commit <laughs> the above popular error, it is a fatal error and your writing effort will be doomed in advance. So mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting advice. And, you know, Kirk kind of, related to to what you were saying earlier it's obviously advice that she lived by you know that's mm -hmm. how she wrote her books was she wrote what she considered to be good and of course she she took good advice from from editors about how to make you know needful editorial sorts of changes over time but it was always her figuring out what it needed to be and what the story should be, and she wasn't going to let anyone tell her, oh, you should change X thing about this story. I think, and there are letters, some of the letters to other people go into this. I think there's, there's one from earlier about We the Living that kind of to her agent at the time when she was trying to sell We the Living that touches on this. There may be some to do with the Fountainhead and, and Atlas later on as well. So you can, you can find those letters as well. But anyway, I thought that was very interesting yeah. advice. And obviously, for Ayn Rand, who really lived that advice, very successful advice as well. So, yeah, I think more than most writers I've ever read about, like some of them, I have been interested in fiction writers. I've read some of what they say about writing. And I think more than any of them, Ayn Rand has seen, ha, seemed to really have a, a strong, clear vision and theory of what success looks like, what fiction is and its purpose from an early point in her life, mm -hmm. which most writers that I know of fiction wise, especially don't have that. They just kind of, you know, like some fiction or they, they had like a tendency, a, a, an ability of a, a, a flair with writing. And then they gave it a hand at it and it seemed to work, but she had like a very clear 
thesis of what is a good f- fiction, why it's important, what it is. And then she went out and tried to execute on that thesis. And I thought that was just a, such a unique approach, not only to career, but just life. Cause she does that a lot. Right. And she shows that it works. Do you have a good rational one? <laughs> and I think the letters yeah. really show that. Yeah. yeah I think she was very value oriented and that in the pursuit of values was central even going back to her early, earliest recollections of her interest in writing and the reasons for writing period she as a very young as a young child was engaged in the world looking out and amassing things that she liked her favorites lists of her favorites and pursuing them whether whether it was a you know a kind of a doll a toy or a um a type of food or a type of music or a type of person and one of the things that writing enabled her to do was to not simply wait passively for the next interesting idea or person or piece of music to come her way but actually to engage in concretizing and depicting something that was important that she could turn into a story and then revisit it well without having to wait for the chance occurrence of someone interesting showing up on her doorstep or in her living room or at some you know in her classroom she could always engage uh and summon her values the things that were the most intimately important to her because she had the ability to cast them in the form of a tale of a story that had that was riven with um the attributes of of valuing which was conflict which was um things at stake and the process of going through uh a character and their pursuit of something at stake was a real joy and and affirmation and she she developed a literary ability that served her well over the course of her life all right and do you have anything no, but that was wonderful, ask? Jeff. Thank you for sharing yeah. those thoughts. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I'm that so glad that we did this. Stuff. I hope that we inspire some people to go and look and, and you know, just really uh, get down into those. I just love the personal aspect of it. So I'll I'll underscore that again as, as we're leaving. Excellent. Yeah, you get a sense of who she is. And yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. She's for real. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You do, it, it's completely different than the, published works mm-hmm, in a positive mm-hmm. way right? yes yeah, but yeah. it's still Ayn Rand so yeah all right any last uh words of wisdom from Jeff well, thanks to Daniel who made all this happen thank you Daniel and, and, and Daniel yeah, thank you Daniel reason. yes thank you <laughs> um, all right well oh go ahead Jeff no okay. no just, I wanted Daniel. to thank uh, both uh Anne and Kirk for making this platform available and for populating it with things that they value and i'm glad that uh i washed up on the shore of that so thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you uh, for having us yeah yes, no absolutely. and thanks for all the super chatters in the comments it was a very yeah. robust comment section today so thank you all for participating um apollo zeus asked a question that we've all he gave another uh, super chat but a question we've already answered uh which is what is your favorite letter in the book but thank you, Apollo, for the super chat. Um, and hopefully if you missed some of the conversation in the video, you can go back and watch. Uh, but I think we've all done this. And, and I, just so everyone knows, if you're not familiar, Anne and I have done two of these other ones, one with of this same Letters of Ayn Rand, one with Shoshana Milgram, and one with Mike Berliner. And so we also have talked about other letters in those as well, if you're interested in digging a little more. Plus, you should you know, buy the book, go to the online exhibit, go to where the exhibits, there's going to be new exhibits coming out, um, you know, be an ARI donor so you can support the archives and learn about all this good stuff. And uh, well, I think we'll leave you with all of that wisdom. Okay. So thank you everybody for another episode of Artful Tuesdays and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Yay.